As far back as we recorded history, from ancient cave paintings to the pyramids, humans have quested for immortality. It is the ultimate prize for a species that can imagine the future and their own eventual death. In recent years, science has transformed that quest into a technological one. Advances in gene therapy have for the first time unlocked very real research pathways. We are entering an era where aging is thought of more as a disease that can be stopped rather than an inevitable feature of life. You think of how much revolution has occurred in the last 10 years in terms of reading and writing DNA. Imagine what we can do in the next 10 and the next 40. We're at the step of translating it from mice to dogs. We've done several tests in dogs now. The next step after that would be into humans, potentially. The whole idea is you come back as a young person. You look in the mirror and go, damn, I look fine. I, I wish I had a thousand more years to see how this plays out. I'm Cody Sheehy, your host. I'm also the director of the documentary, Make People Better. This film tells the story of how a Chinese scientist secretly created the world's first genetically engineered babies. And I'm your co-host, Samira Kiani, a medical doctor, genetic engineer, and producer of the film. You're listening to the Make People Better podcast, brought to you by the Random Good Foundation, where we introduce you to the greatest minds and most interesting people at the cusp of a genetic engineering revolution that is transforming science fiction into science fact. Many scientists familiar with this research believe that it is very likely that gene therapies have the potential to extend our health span, which is the span of time that we're healthy, to at least 120 years. Where the technology goes from there is less clear. It's plausible that all the mechanisms related to aging and decay will be solved. This episode includes our conversations with Andrew Hassel, who is a microbiologist and futurist, Max Moore, the former president of a cryogenic facility called Alcor. Next stop is to meet with Dr. George Church, the legendary genomic pioneer. He has started a company called Rejuvenate Bio with his protege, Noah Davidson. The ultimate vision is when people see the safety of radically increasing the lifespans of their beloved pets. They will become much more comfortable trying the same therapy on themselves. So let's dive in after a word from our sponsors. The Make People Better podcast is brought to you by the Random Good Foundation. For me, the concept of immortality, it's a little tricky. One way to think about it, at least that I think about it, is that my body and my consciousness and everything that makes me, me, is aging and then someday I'm gonna die. And if I can just prevent that process forever, that's immortality. But from the point of view of, of an evolutionary biologist, there's part of us that's already immortal. And that's the DNA that's like safely held inside of me. And it's been evolving and passing from generation to generation through each of my ancestors through time. And now it's inside of me. And I already have a son. And so it's going to continue safely on into the future through him and then to his children and his children. So from the point of view of DNA, it's already immortal. My human body it's kind of just a temporary shell that's housing it just for a little period of time. I like the angle of um, immortality of human DNA uh, from the revolutionary perspective. If you're talking about removing death, I always feared death. And growing up, never wanted to think about it, obviously, and was jumping to the idea of removing death. I wanted that. And I think part of me still loves the idea. But another part of me has recently started to look at life differently. That we have a 
purpose coming to this world and that we are in the path of spiritual growth and death is part of that process. But if you are looking at it from the angle of increasing health span, I would jump at it. Let me give you one personal reason. I'm 41 and I wish my fertility age could have been extended somehow so that I could have a chance to have my own biological child. I want that. But the idea of removing death altogether, I don't think I want that. Because I don't think that life and the purpose of it would exist as we think of it uh, without death. What if Kim Jong-un, the supreme leader of North Korea, never died and ruled over North Korea forever? (laughs) Oh my God, that would be horrible. I think it's interesting to like look back in history a little bit and see some of these like super wealthy and powerful people um, who become obsessed with perpetuating themselves, you know, forever. And I think they're caught up in that early phase of maturity that you described, like the pyramids, for example, these monuments to the pharaohs. Do you know, Samara, much about the pyramids? Like what is what was the purpose of them? Yeah, as far as I know, it's some of the earliest concepts of immortality that goes back to more than 3,000 years BC. They were one of the very first civilizations who believed in life after death, and that the soul reaches back to body and it starts a new eternal life, right? They wanted to be comfortable. So Pharaohs built enormous tombs filled with important things that they wanted to have in their eternal life. So when they had no way to actually stop aging and prevent death, this was their solution is to create life after death. that's in like a new form, a very metaphysical afterlife. Because when I look around at the world's religions, I see that as kind of a core component. I mean, that's what they're offering to everybody. But there's this other thing that I've noticed too, which is another way to claim immortality is to make your mark on history. And I see like powerful titans of business or empires and and conquerors that are trying to reshape the world and name everything after themselves as an example of trying to make their mark on history. And it reminds me of this great movie, Gladiator, which is one of my favorite movies. The opening scene where Russell Crowe is like giving the speech to all the soldiers right before they go into battle and most of them are going to die, you know? Let's listen to it. Hold the line. Stay with me. You find yourself alone, riding in green fields with the sun on your face. Do not be troubled, for you are in Elysium, and you're already dead. (laughs) Brothers, what we do in life. Brothers, humanity. You know, Cody, all of these points, as I said, are centered around metaphysical immortality. But there's a long history of people seeking actual physical ways to stay alive forever. And there's a couple awesome examples of that. One is the fountain of youth, fountain where you drink this water and you will be restored. Another great one is like King Arthur's knights. They were searching for the Holy Grail. And supposedly, if you find the Holy Grail and drink from the Holy Grail, it'll restore you to your youth, you will live forever, and you will live in happiness. It's an actual potion. And it's so interesting to see that in the modern world, a technology-centered approach is how these ancient ambitions are being expressed. I thought our interview with Andrew Hessel captured these ideas very well. As you know, Andrew is a microbiologist and geneticist and an entrepreneur. He's also a prolific speaker and an advocate for promoting the positive benefits of synthetic biology. So, Andrew, how does a microbiologist think about life? The way I think about life is that it's information processing. The information processing in this case is is done with molecules. 
Um, but it's an information processor. The cell is, is taking in information from its environment, it's processing it, it's doing calculations, it's doing, making decisions. And yes, it is controlled by a digital code, the operating system, the, the genome of, of the cell. Uh, the entire system is functioning as a, as a form of molecular computer. So what is your perspective about death then? Uh, well, I think death uh, makes life a little more meaningful um, because it, anything that has an endpoint, a deadline, uh, I think uh, is motivating. <laughs> um, I don't worry about death too much. Uh, there's no reason for anything to truly die anymore. Um, one of the things I found really fascinating being a cell biologist is that we can take samples of a, of a more complex organism, a few cells, and, and put them in a freezer um, and, and pull them out later, a, a sample, and, and continue to grow them. Who knows what technologies we'll have in 20, 50, 100, 1,000 years, but there's no reason f you know, for our genetic programs to be lost to time anymore. So you're predicting that eventually we will understand biology to the point that we can truly capture immortality, everlasting youth. Look, I, when it comes to the biological process of development and aging, it, it's pretty scripted. You know, the first, uh, from, the, from the formation of the zygote, uh, sperm and egg meeting, it, it runs a program, at least I'm just speaking for humans here. It runs a program that ultimately produces the development of a baby, and I'm learning this because I have two small children, is, is again pretty much a program. It's scripted. You go to the doctor and they know at three months, at six months, at one year, two years, three years, you're supposed to hit all these mo developmental milestones. And so it's pretty much a program. And then by the time you get to, you know, the first de couple of decades in life, by the time you're 20, you've pretty much run uh, not only the biological program, but you're starting to run the social program, the, the, the nurture part of human biology. And, and now you're trying to just have your life. You've learned how to walk and talk and eat and defecate and potentially reproduce, copulate. And, and now you're starting to, you know, to really move into the next stage of 20 years of growth, um, which is really when we blossom, you know, professionally, socially, and just as individuals. The third decade, you kind of get to enjoy it and enjoy helping your children go through this process. And the last, uh, the last 20 years, you, you kind of just decline and die. Um, and, and trying to figure out, well, how do we slow aging or stop aging or reverse aging is, are all really new areas of biological research. And I'm absolutely an optimist when it comes to these technologies. I, there are certainly risks, and, and we're going to learn from them, and we'll course correct. And I know from actuarial tables, I've got until you know my mid to late eighties. Um, that's not so long, you know, away. My risk tolerance for this type of manipulation and engineering actually grows over time. Uh, I I would use more and more biotechnologies as I get older to sustain myself. Without uh, and taking the risk personally, because I know what the end game is. I think it's just um, one of the most exciting times to be alive, because all of a sudden we, uh, you know, we're not just at the mercy of the machinery anymore. Now we get to open up the hood and tinker with it and start to think about where we might want to take it. I think that's just a, a staggering shift in, in human evolution. And, and I hope it excites people more than it scares them, because really a, a, a life just running the standard program, born, dying, we, we know what that's like. It, it's so short, it's so fleeting. I, I wish I had a thousand more years to see how this plays out. One thing I really like about Andrew is his optimism. And I actually feel like all the people that we kind of talked to about immortality over many years now, they seem to have that 
trade in common. Yes, I agree. Technology is viewed as completely beneficial in the long run. In fact, this techno optimism and promise of immortality has inspired the movement of supporters and early adopters who are known as transhumanists. One of the original founders of the movement is the British philosopher Max Moore. They aspire to augment human intelligence, physical ability, and lifespan with an ever-growing of mechanical and biological enhancements. The end goal is that humanity would eventually transition from human beings into a post-human form that could achieve immortality. If you would have said the definition of a transhumanist, uh, I don't know, to me, 20 years ago, it would have just seemed so outlandish. But now it's like seeped into popular culture and it's, it's everywhere. And even if you don't know the word, we all know the idea of like augmenting ourselves with devices like iPhones or watches or someday implanting medical devices. And it's like this slow progression into the eventual outcome, which I guess would be we're kind of almost like an Android, you know, like it's just more and more technology solves the problems we have and also enhance the abilities that we have. I think transhumanists, in my view, really are just embracing uh, this pathway that we seem to be on already. I went to a very interesting talk a few years ago in which uh, one of the feminist thinkers was giving a talk about transhumanism. And one of the things she said was that a lot of times the ideas of associated with transhumanism come from males. But there is a female or gender bias kind of viewpoint here. And one of the examples that she gave was that if the idea of transhumanism is, is actually augmenting our body, isn't that something that many women are doing every day when they wake up and put makeup on and do their hair, you know? That's kind of going what our normal body is like. It's kind of like enhancing our body. We put color on it. That's some form of transhumanism by itself, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, think of breast implants and every all the body work that gets done in California. They're all uh, part of the club. Exactly. Well, let's talk about Max, because Max actually founded it or kind of started it in a lot of ways through his writing and thinking. And he also founded a company called Alcor, which I think is fascinating. So Alcor is a place where you can kind of like translate your life insurance, pay that out, pay him and his uh, engineers, and they will then cryogenically freeze you uh, at the moment that you've been declared dead because it's illegal to freeze someone before they're done. So they have to be declared dead. And then they will be kept at a super cool temperature far into the future. And some point in the future, we're assuming in this scenario that there's going to be amazing technology to repair whatever it was that killed you and possibly also reverse you to a young person. So they would then wake you up with new technology that's been developed to revive cryogenically frozen people, fix them completely, and then you would essentially be like a time traveler that just wakes up in the future young again. Do you remember going there to see him, Samara? I, I, I kind of also remember my visceral reaction when we walked into that facility. I don't know, I kind of felt cold. So my, my reaction going in was the whole thing seemed a little wacky and I wasn't sure what to expect. What we found, I think, was actually a very clinical situation. Very nice, like, medical bay where the bodies are received. I think that's where we should actually start the conversation with Max is actually in the medical bay where the bodies are coming in and they do the freezing process. So there's like these operation tables all around. There's like a CT scanner in one corner and they're going to start to prepare people to be frozen. Essentially, what we're doing here is not too different to people in hospitals from donating organs. In fact, that's actually what you're doing, right? You're donating all your organs to yourself. Essentially. So what we do is after legal death has been declared, hopefully we're there standing by ready, if we've had any warning, and move the patient into the ice bath, cover them with ice. Uh, we're restoring respiration. And the reason we need to recirculate is that if you just inject all the medications, like the anti-clotting agents, the membrane stabilizers, if you inject them in somewhere with no circulation, it's just going to sit there. People wonder why we restart everything. That's the reason. 
So basically we're trying to protect the patient while we get them to the operating room and, uh, and then actually cryoprotect the cells so we can go down below freezing without causing ice formation. Right, it's because if the ice forms incorrectly, it can burst open and damage the cells, cause organ damage. Interesting. So how many patients are there at Alcor now? We just had a new one, I think it's 157 right now. And it's slowly accelerating, so we're averaging probably around 10, 11 a year on average, but it really bounces around. So eventually it will be you know, tens of thousands per day. <laughs> Not yet. Why do people want to be frozen? Do they tell you their reasons for wanting this? I mean, is there like a common thread that's emerged from your customers? I kind of, I like to turn the question around, really. What's driving the design not to do this? Why do people want to die when there's plenty of interesting, fun stuff to do for the indefinite future? So, so the same reason why people will take uh, you know, cancer drugs and have heart surgery, because they don't, they're not ready to die yet. So it's just a little bit more radical. But essentially, you're just in a coma, but with no metabolism. It's not much different from being in a long-term coma. The whole idea is you come back as a young person. You look in the mirror and go, damn, I look fine. <laughs> How long do you think these people will be frozen? Well, it's really impossible to say. I don't believe in nice exponential projections. I really don't know, but you know, if you really force me to guess, I'll say in 100 years maybe. But you know, if the AI people are right, then we might solve problems a lot faster and it might be sooner, but we don't know. But it doesn't really matter to our patients as long as the organization is sound and we've been around for almost half a century. Whether it's a day or a hundred years really makes no difference from their point of view. They're just so cold, everything is locked in place, there's no metabolism, it really doesn't make any difference. Uh, then you probably start with the easiest patients, the ones maybe cryobreathed more recently with better technology uh, under good circumstances. and and kind of work your way back to the more difficult cases. Now we are in this storage area. Let's just take a second to describe what we're seeing, which is pretty amazing. We are in this large room with high ceilings and filled with probably a dozen huge stainless steel storage pots. The room is bathed in a purple light back in the corner. There are machines that are occasionally emitting jets of what looks like very cold gas. I have a feeling of reverence, almost like a temple, but it's, but if it's a temple, it isn't filled with priests, but instead, I would say time travelers. So welcome to the Alcor's Patient Care Bay. We have 157 patients, uh, about 70 pets. Actually, you can see a patient in cool down where you can't see them, but we have a patient being pulled down right now who came in just a couple of days ago and the computer is controlling the cool down rate. So the process of waking up a person is probably very difficult as well. Have you tested that on any animals or anything? Yes, actually, kind of. A uh, very small animal. It's very difficult. You know, obviously, we can reverse the carbs of corneas and skin and heart valves and all kinds of things like that. And embryos. There are millions of people walking around who are cryopreserved as an embryo. But when you go from single tissues to even a whole human organ, you're really pushing the limits of today. There's been some success in doing that in a lab in California that we work with, but we're still getting there. And then from organ to an organism is really impossible to reverse at any size. However, we have done it with C. elegans, this little microscopic worm that's very well studied. And we actually, first of all, taught it a very simple memory task. It doesn't have very many neurons, but it has enough to, you know, with the benzaldehyde, I'm gonna go this way to get my food, not that way. Uh, we cryopreserved it after the training, uh, rewarmed it, which is easy because it's so small, you can do it rapidly. And we were able to demonstrate in a published peer-reviewed paper that yes, it did retain its memory. But you know, 30 years ago, I thought by now we'd have made much more advances, but there's no funding for it. So I think that will happen, but will it be soon enough for me? Samara, so as a medical doctor and also a research scientist, what do you make of cryogenic freezing? Well, um, in research lab, we regularly freeze down cells from animals and bring them back into life. Here I see attempts to replicate these processes at an organismal level. However, it will be very complicated to achieve this goal. So it requires a lot of you know, research and perfecting protocols. Having said that, I won't be surprised if 30 or 50 years from now, we will have solved this issue. He 
alluded to that. He's he's thinking that maybe the way that they're freezing people today is not very good and that as we learn more and more about this, we'll probably change the process for freezing and for waking them up. But there's this idea that we'll get so good at this that even the people who are frozen incorrectly today, however that is, maybe we can bring them back too. You know, one of the very crazy things for me was seeing those individuals who only opted to freeze their head. What would that existence look like when they wake up? Which means that they essentially are comfortable with their whole existence downloaded in a software or robot. Oh my God, I, I can't really imagine that. It's hard to imagine what that would actually be like if it's like anything. Well, one thing that's critical here is that most people, they actually want to be young again. And so another key piece of technology that they need to be developed before they're revived is actually the technology to reverse their age. That technology is actually becoming pretty plausible. One of the pioneers developing that is Dr. George Church of Harvard Medical School. And he's kind of best known, I think, to a lot of people as the guy who wants to bring back the woolly mammoth. But Samara, what is he known for in science? One of the most important contributions of George to the field has been inventing ways to read our genome. I think it's interesting that when he gives a presentation, he always puts up his conflict of interest slide. And he does that just to be totally transparent. And so this is all the companies that he founded, the companies that are based on his patents, his advisory roles groups that have funded his research, and there's over 342 entries on that. It's, it's just so impressive, his degree of contribution to the technology and his vastness of vision. I admire him. Yeah, so I think the next step is let's go to Boston and sit down with Dr. George Church and find out the reality of age reversal. We met George on this stage of the Boston Symphony Hall. The huge space with brilliant chandeliers high above was an impressive backdrop for a mind-blowing conversation with one of the world's leading geneticists. Dr. Church, I have a quote that was attributed to you, which I'll read. And it says, as I wander through life, I'll get that feeling that I've come back from the future and I'm living in the past and it's a horrible feeling. (laughs) So I'm wondering what the backstory of that quote is and uh, what does it mean? I think that mainly, I, I, I sort of felt like my brain was kind of permanently wired to think about the future and variations on it that I would invent. Uh, and it, and it, and you want to be there, you know, because it's, it's shinier and cooler than what you have right now. Almost by definition, it's like the greener grass on the other side of the hill, that kind of thing. So you're known for being a great pioneer in the field of genetics, and many of the technologies you've created have brought the costs of reading and writing DNA down by something on the order of 10 million fold. So now one of the major focuses of your research is into age reversal. What do you think the possibilities are? So I'm uh, 63 right now. And if you think of how much revolution has occurred in the last 10 years in terms of reading and writing DNA, uh, computing, deep learning, and so forth, uh, imagine what we can do in the next 10 and the next 40. And just in terms of my own work on aging reversal, we have a a paper coming out soon where we cure four diseases of aging with one gene therapy that involves two genes, which is definitely in the direction where we want to go, where we tackle all the different things that decay in a way that where we get reversal. And we know that that can happen in in animals. So I, I think that that's certainly what I'm personally focusing on. And I think there's a lot of progress here. We do the experiments on two year old mice, which is they're almost dead from aging and 12-year-old dogs, so you can make mice last twice as long as the average mouse um, with just three genetic changes. In principle, if you can reverse, you can just keep reversing. Um, Maybe eventually there will be specific problems with the one part of your body that you can't really replace easily with stem cells, which is the brain, because it has all these connections. 
But I think even that uh, we should be able to, to handle, in which case then you keep reversing until an accident happens, like an asteroid hits. But I, I, yeah, I think there's a good possibility that many of the people alive today, not just the babies, some of the older ones, uh, would have that opportunity to greatly extend. I've been talking to a lot of people about this, people who haven't really thoughtfully considered the idea before. And honestly, people just kind of look at me strange. They just don't really believe this. It, it just sounds too out there. So if I told them there's a new cell phone coming out, or even that we're going to be landing on Mars in 20 years, they might believe that. But the idea that potentially there are people alive today who will live forever just doesn't sound real. Well, I think if they, you say forever, then that is unbelievable. But if you say a thousand years... If, if they were sitting across from you at a party and they said, I just don't believe that people will live a thousand years. I don't even believe that they'll live 250 years. How would you convince them that this is very real? Well, it's not my business to convince them. I'm, I, I, uh, I communicate what I think the way things are. We have a huge variation just within mammals. You know, mice typically live two years. Bowhead whales live 200 years. That's within mammals. So it's clearly biologically programmed. And we have you know, species on the planet that live thousands of years. So, so there's nothing magical about 250. So in medicine, there's a colorful history of people testing new drugs on themselves that they invent. Are you testing any of these things currently? M minor. I'm, I'm waiting for good clinical trials on some of the technologies that, that my lab is developing and others. Nothing genetically engineered? Nothing genetically engineered, no. Yeah. How, how many years away is that? Well, we hope to have clinical trials in dogs. Uh, well, they're, they're kind of starting now. And then that will be a veterinary product. Two years later, we could uh, start human clinical trials with the experience we had from mice and dogs. So one of the things about George Church is that many, many scientists go to George to ask questions about the direction of future technology. And we've heard from many people that he's quite good at his predictions. At the end of the interview, he mentioned the dogs that they are reversing the age of. That really became a clue for us to where to go next. Yes, so George is involved in many companies all over the world. And this one is called Rejuvenate Bio. And George co-founded it with one of his former students, Noah Davidson, and also another student named Dan Oliver, who was from Harvard Business School. So they're very far along in getting approval uh, to do age reversal therapies for dogs. And George was kind enough to make an introduction to Noah. Everybody knows George, or at least yeah. within this world. Yeah. George who? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. When you first sat down with Noah and Dan at their offices, they were just concluding trials on the American Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Yes. Noah, how did you get interested in longevity research? Originally, I was applied physics and then joined George's lab to work on aging. Um, when I first met George, he said, I was like, I want to work on aging. He's like, great, I'm getting older. And so uh, I thought it was a really, <laughs> this was going to be a really good collaboration from then on. Well, I just wanted to do the simple thing of we can make mice live twice as long. Why has none of this information been translated into dogs and people that we care about making them live longer, healthier lives? Now, tell us more about the aging process across the animal kingdom. The general thing about aging is you have a very coordinated program to go from a baby to an adult. And there are very specific epigenetic changes that are made to turn you into an adult, to turn on specific genes at different times. And after you become an adult, there's kind of no more regulation to keep those changes the way they were. Dan, how would you explain what you and Noah are doing? At different times in your life, you're expressing different genes in different amounts, which creates certain proteins that are going around your body and signals basically everything that's going on. And as you age, that kind of balance gets out of whack. And what these longevity gene experiments do is they keeping the mouse um, in balance longer, which then has these health benefits and also the benefit of 
increasing their lifespan. Noah, I'm gathering that the hope someday is to move past dogs and into humans. We're at the step of translating it from mice to dogs. We've done several tests in dogs now and proven how safe our therapy is. We're just trying to uh, get the dose right. But the next step after that would be into humans, potentially. George told us that people may not be able to accept age reversal yet. Like, we just aren't <laughs> ready for that. Uh, so that the plan is that you would roll it out with their pets first, let people get used to having that kind of happen safely in an animal that they love, something that's in their home, and then that's gonna really pave the way for humans to actually want the same therapy. Is that right? Well, we want, we want strong data. You know, there's multiple ways of doing that. Having a therapy come out that really is doing the things we're claiming, increasing health span, curing age-related disease in dogs. Yeah, I don't see how people wouldn't become more comfortable with it, or at least wouldn't be excited about it. My takeaway is that immortality tech isn't quite there yet, but it is one of those things that could develop very rapidly. Because at the same time, I also feel that it's pretty realistic. My attitude shifted from this being pretty sci-fi to actually seeing that it is very possible. Fighting age-related diseases is very possible. However, I'm not certain enough whether we can achieve true immortality, literally. I mean, we've been discussing the technology, and just for fun, let's imagine that this actually did happen. I think what would happen is people would quit having children. The pressure to have children would decline. You could put it off for a thousand years. There's no reason to do it right now. And it may be that we actually um, kind of quit evolving as humans. It's just our lifespan just becomes so long that evolution essentially becomes frozen. And so what's interesting about this to me is it's really the opposite of the designer baby problem, which is that humans are speeding up and taking control of human evolution. This is the opposite. So we have two sort of competing forces on evolution that are both being created by the same genomic revolution. Yeah, a natural evolution is being shaped by so many variables. We don't know yet what challenges we may face later. So there is an immense responsibility to make decisions about which genes we want to change or select for a certain genetic diversity in ourselves. In the time since we met Noah and Dan, Rejuvenate Bio has successfully completed pilot trials and they've raised an additional 10 million in Series A funding. Join us for the next episode. We will be exploring a growing international community of do-it-yourself or DIY biohackers. This group of amateur scientists are learning the tricks of the trade and setting up labs in their basements and garages. Perhaps the most influential of the biohackers, Joe Zayner, is borrowing from the ethos of Silicon Valley and argues for a future without regulation. He thinks that it is the best way to prevent big government and big companies from controlling the technology. Please support this podcast by sharing it and leave us a review. We would also love to add your voice to this conversation. We will be hosting a live discussion around this topic and you're invited to join. Check the show notes for details. The Make People Better podcast is brought to you by the Random Good Foundation. Thanks, and we'll talk with you again soon.